you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Acts chapter 24. How many of you are keeping up with your New Testament reading? How many of you are falling behind and you've given up? (laughs) All right. Now as we come to Acts chapter 24, we've uh, we've been going through the book of Acts now for the last few weeks, and this will be our last sermon from the book of Acts, because next week I'm planning on being in Hebrews chapter 1, which will be the the, the last reading of next week, and I plan to cover chapter 1 because I think we have to hit chapter 1 to really understand the rest of the book of Hebrews, so I don't want to uh, miss out on uh, chapter 1 of Hebrews. So today we're going to look at our last uh, look at the book of Acts as we're continuing to read through the New Testament together, and as each week we uh, pick a passage out of that previous week's reading and we uh, look at it a little bit closer in our sermon as we've been going through the book of Acts, we have been looking at how the gospel continued to spread after Jesus left this earth. Uh, we see his ascension in chapter 1, and then we see uh, the, the, the disciples were told that they would be witnesses of Jesus' throughout the, the earth. And in chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit poured out upon them and they empower them in order to be those witnesses. And then we see that gospel beginning to spread out from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and into the entire Roman world. Uh, Now, as we see that gospel spread, we mentioned previously that uh, in multiple places we see that the gospel was having great impact on people, and people were being saved and being added to the number of the church. So we see that the church was growing uh, in by leaps and bounds quickly because of what was going on at that time. But at the same time, we see that opposition to the gospel was quite fierce. There was great persecution of the church during that time. In fact, Paul, the Apostle Paul, was uh, one of the chief persecutors of the church before his conversion to Christianity. Uh, and there we see Paul rounding people up, putting them in prison, approving of their uh, their their stonings and their beatings and their murder. Uh, Paul was a great persecutor of the church, which was quite an amazing thing when Paul became a believer, when he had his encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and he was converted. Uh, in fact, many of the early Christians, when they first heard of that, were skeptical. Uh, this, this can't be. He's the one who has been uh, persecuting the church so greatly, but Paul became... Uh, probably the greatest missionary to ever live uh, as, his, as he was converted to Christianity. And as we get into chapter 24 now, we're continuing to look at the life of Paul here. Um, and as we uh, come into chapter 24, we see that Paul, has, uh, he, had, he had been in Jerusalem, he had gone to the temple, and while he was at the temple, there were a group of Jews who were not happy to see him there because they saw him as a troublemaker because he had been preaching and he had been uh, proclaiming the name of Christ. So they see uh, Paul there and they seize him and they uh, they make all kinds of accusations against him. Uh, As they took him to the governing uh, officials there in Jerusalem, they they uh, the governor was going to have uh, the governing official was going to have Paul flogged and then released uh, to appease the Jews who had brought him. But then Paul brought up the fact that, hey, you're going to flog a Roman citizen without a due trial? And that was just unheard of. There was, that would have been a, a, a bad thing for this to happen. Uh, Roman citizens had rights. They had the right to a trial. Uh, and so for this, when this uh information was brought forward, all of a sudden it changed things. So instead of having Paul flogged, uh, the the official there in Jerusalem decided, I'm going to send Paul on to Felix, the governor of Judea, uh, to decide his case. And that's what we find when we get into chapter 24 and begin to read. Uh, Paul being sent before Felix 
to have this uh, case decided, these accusations that have been brought against Paul decided by the uh, Judean governor. So let's pick up. We're, we're going to focus in on verses 22 to 27, but I want to actually read the entire chapter because it brings in a little bit of the context of what we're talking about. So let's look at chapter 24, verses 1 through 27 together. It says, After five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than twelve days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man." Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation, should they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias, the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And he reasoned about righteousness and self-control in the coming judgment. Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money should be, would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Let's pray together. Father, we come to your word this morning and we seek to understand what it has to say to us. We ask that these words that were written so many years for our benefit would, would be clear that your spirit would impress upon us the truths we find here. And Lord, that as we hear these truths, that we would respond to them in the appropriate way. That your name would be glorified among us. Lord, that uh, we would be moved to worship you. We thank you for this word. We thank you that we have your word written down from so many years ago to study together that we might know you we might know of all that you have done, that we might know our Savior and all he has done, and that we might have hope in his name. We pray these things now in the name of Christ. Amen. 
So Paul now is standing before Felix to have these accusations decided. So the first thing we need to ask here is, who is Felix? What do we know about him from the pages of history? Just, not just what we read here in Scripture, but what do we know about this man's background? Well, I did a little bit of digging and found out a little bit more about Felix. We mentioned already that he was the governor of Judea. And he was reigning or ruling under the, uh, the, uh, the authority of Emperor Claudius. We know that he was born a slave. And then eventually he had gained his freedom and had gained, over time, he had gained his position here as the governor of Judea. His name is Felix, and the pro, it's a, a, a possibility that his name was not originally Felix, but he became known as Felix because the name Felix means happy. And so his, free, his move from being a slave to being a freedman to being a quite powerful freedman uh, would explain possibility of why his name was Felix, the happy one. We also know that he was married three times, but we only know two of his wives' names. Uh, interest. Uh, what is interesting about this is the two names that we do know, they are both named Drusilla. Uh, his first wife and his second wife were both Drusilla. The first was Drusilla of Mauritania, the younger, who, and uh, she was the granddaughter of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, so I'm sure you've heard those names before. So Drusilla of Mauritania, the younger. And then the second wife, uh, the one actually we read about here in the pages of Scripture was Drusilla of Judea. Uh, and she was the daughter of Herod Agrippa in Cyprus. These two, uh, Drusilla of Judea and Felix, had a son. Uh, and I bring him up because it's interesting what happened to the son. His name was Marcus Antonius Agrippa. And he died due to a volcanic eruption. When Mount Vesuvius uh, erupted on August 24th in the year 79. Uh, their son was killed due to that eruption. It's just kind of an uh, interesting, uh, strange event to, to hear that. So uh, their son had died due to this uh, volcanic eruption. Now according to Tacitus, who's a, a, an early uh, historian, Felix was a cruel ruler. In fact, uh, here's a quote from Tacitus' uh, histories. Uh, it, it says there, Antonius Felix practiced every kind of cruelty and lust, wielding the power of a king with the instincts of a slave. Josephus, also an early historian, tells us that uh, uh, Felix was unable to control the, the region that he was assigned to. The, he was especially unable to control the constant revolts that were taking place among the Jewish people. It's interesting, too, that uh, as we read this passage here, we are seeing kind of one of those kind of revolts that is exactly what he was unable to control very well. The Jewish people in this uproar over Paul, bringing these accusations to him, and Felix was never able to really handle this. This was a, the kind of thing that Rome did not want. They wanted their people to be quiet and obey the rules, and they didn't want all of this uproar taking place. So as Felix was put in place to kind of deal with this, he never really was able to do so. After the death of Claudius, Emperor Claudius, Nero re became the emperor, and he replaced Felix with a new governor named Festus. And actually, when we get to the end of the passage, we see this transition take place. Place. So here we have Paul standing before this Felix, the one I just described to you, uh, the governor of Judea, and he's being accused of, by the Jews of stirring up trouble, of teaching things contrary to their law. Well, it's, it's Paul in response to saying, no, they know that I serve the, the God and I worship God and I, I worship him according to the law. Uh, so there's this debate within the uh, uh, Judaism about who is truly worshiping or not. Well, it says here in verse 22, it says, but Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, talking about the Jews, put the Jews off saying, 
when Lysias the Tribune comes down, I will, re- I will decide your case. It tells us here that Felix has an accurate understanding and this accurate knowledge of the way. A couple other translations have it a little bit worded a little bit different, but same gist. The King James says that he had a more perfect knowledge of the way. Of that way. The NIV says he was well acquainted with the way. Either way you translate it, what the, what the gist of this is saying is Felix, when he hears the Jews accusing Paul, he, under, he has a pretty firm grasp on what Paul really believes what Paul has been preaching and teaching and following. He has an accurate understanding of the way. And what does that mean? What do, what do you mean by the way? What exactly is that referring to? Well, we see this, this phrase come up in multiple places in Acts. We saw it back in verse 14 of chapter uh, 24. There it says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers. Believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. This is what Paul is stating. He says, uh, according to the way. Uh, He's speaking of the Christianity. He's speaking of the Christian way. the, The walk of faith that he has. We saw it earlier in Acts in chapter 9 verses 1 and 2. Uh, As we'll pull this one up on the screen. It says, but Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that they found, if he found any, any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now this is interesting because once Paul persecuted the same thing that the Jews are so upset about, he persecuted the way. Those who belong to the way. Those who belong to Christ. Christians. And so now when we get down to uh, uh, chapter 24, Paul is saying that he is following the scriptures according to the way, according to Christianity. These Jews are really upset about it and making accusations. But we find out that Felix is very, he has a very high understanding of the way. Christianity. We can ask ourselves, well, how did this happen? How did he, how does he, come to understand this like we aren't told maybe he heard someone preaching it uh, or maybe he's had other cases come before him where he's had to figure these things out we're just simply we don't know but whatever it is Felix understands the way the ESV again uh, uh, characterizes his understanding as accurate he has a rather accurate knowledge of the way the word here that's translated as accurate in the ESV, has, a, has the sense of it's accurate, it's precise, it's diligent, it's complete. The King James actually uh, hits on that word complete by saying a more perfect understanding. The, the word perfect has this idea of completeness. He has this complete understanding of Christianity. That, that's a surprise to me when I read that. This, that this governor here, uh, a Roman governor who's ruling over the area of Judea, has this accurate, complete understanding of Christianity. Uh, we, we can quickly read past that without just kind of thinking about what that means exactly. He, he knows a lot about it. His, uh, and his knowledge about Christianity is good. But at the same time, while he has all this understanding about what Christianity is all about, it's apparent that he knows about the way, but he is not on the way. He has a lot of knowledge about Christianity, but he's not a Christian. He he knows a lot about Jesus, but he doesn't know Jesus personally. He has all the information, but what has he done with it? Uh, I, I don't want to gloss over this because I think this same kind of thing can be a danger to us as well. Uh, as we sit in our church and as we come together and we discuss the Bible and we discuss our faith with one another, uh, 
it can be a danger for us that we have all the information, we have all the, the facts and all the, the knowledge about what Christianity is, we know all the right answers. Someone asks the question, we can raise our hand, we can answer the question and give the right answer. Uh, we can play trivia, Bible trivial pursuits and do really well and maybe even beat everybody at it. But at the same time, we aren't Christians ourselves. We're a lot like uh, Felix here. We have an accurate understanding of the way but we're not on the way. We have all the information, but it hasn't changed us. We know what Christ has done. We have the knowledge of that, but we simply do not know Jesus. We don't have a personal relationship with Christ. So in the end, what we have is we have knowledge, but we don't have life. This is who Felix was. And we got to be careful that that's not who we are. We can have all the right information and still not be saved. Now, at the same time, I don't want to take this the opposite extreme. Uh, I'm not saying that we don't need knowledge. Uh, sometimes I hear folks saying, well, you know about God, but I don't care about knowing about God. I just want to know God. I don't want to know the Bible. I want to know the God of the Bible. I hear those kinds of statements occasionally. And I would push back on that and say, well, how does that work exactly? How can you know God without knowing about God? Uh, uh, put it into the, the context of a relationship between a husband and a wife. Uh, for instance, say I'm, I, I, we'll just use me and my wife, Rachel. Uh, say Rachel and I are, are talking, and, uh, and she says, you know, let me tell you a story about when I was younger, about what happened to me. And I'd be like, I don't want to know about you. I just want to know you. How, does that make any sense? Every time she starts to tell me a little bit about herself, well, let me tell you my favorite color, or let me tell you what I like or what I don't like, or well, I don't want to know about you, I just want to know you. That makes no sense. Sometimes we treat God that way. Though. I don't want to know about you. I don't want to know the theology. I don't want to know all the, the, the information. I just want to know you. Well, theology is the study of God. It, is ta it tells us who God is, what God has done. It helps us to know who He is accurately. So we can't dismiss our relationship with God as being one of, well, I don't need theology. I just want to know God. We need theology in order to know God. It's, the, it's, it's what we do with that information that's so important. We have all the knowledge, but where do, what do we do with the knowledge once we have it? And that's what, where we are with Felix here in this passage. Felix has an accurate understanding of the way, but what's he going to do with that? Are you here today and you have an accurate understanding of what the Bible says, what it teaches about who Christ is and what Christ has done, but you haven't done anything with it. What will you do with that knowledge? Other than be able to answer the questions in Sunday school class or as you're debating someone in an area of theology, what have you done with that knowledge? Has it driven you into relationship with your Savior. So we, we need knowledge, but it just simply can't stop at just knowledge. Uh, how does that knowledge impact us? Notice here, as we continue to read about uh, 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 Felix here, as he speaks with Paul, it says here, after some days... Felix came, this is verse 24, after some days Felix came with his wife Priscilla who was Jewish and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus and as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the 
same time he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. It tells us here that Paul came to Felix and spoke to him about faith in Christ Jesus. This was the content of their discussion. That's really interesting to me because, remember, Paul is here under arrest, uh, being falsely accused by the Jews. And when Paul has an opportunity to talk with Felix, the one who is ultimately going to decide his case, what does Paul talk about? He doesn't talk to Felix about, you know, this is all false, I'm innocent, and you should let me out of here. Uh, No, that's not what Paul says. Paul, Paul comes to Felix, and Paul sees Felix as an opportunity to share the gospel. And it says as he talks with Felix, he speaks to him about faith in Christ Jesus. And so Paul's focus here is on presenting the gospel. And that's exactly what he's been doing throughout the book of Acts. As he's now here before Felix, as he was in prison before, sharing it with those that he was in prison with. And it's just a, a, it's an amazing thing to think of how Paul was so committed to this. And Felix, on the, on the flip side of that coin, was constantly, it tells us for two years, he was interacting with Paul concerning the gospel. Think about this. Felix, for two years, had this interaction with one of the great preachers to ever preach the word. One of the ones who wrote a a large part of our New Testament. Felix had the opportunity for two years to interact and dialogue about about the way with this man. It tells us he must have actually enjoyed it. In verse 26, it tells us that he had Paul come and speak to him often or regularly. Verse 26, it says at the same time he... He hoped that the money would be given to him by Paul, so he sent for him often and conversed with him. I know it says here that, look, he hoped that he would get some money from doing this, but let's not miss the first phrase of this verse here. It says, at the same time. At the same time, because of what had gone And as he reasoned, as Paul reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. Felix was being impacted by what Paul had to say. And so he, he actually was, he, he was enjoying these dialogues with Paul. But it says, and at the same time, he was also hoping to get some money from Paul. So don't divorce the two. Both are true. Felix was intrigued by Paul's teaching. While at the same time, he was hoping to, Get a bribe. It tells us here that Paul's message that he was uh, uh, speaking to Felix was about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. This is verse 25. Uh, Simply put, Paul was speaking to Felix about Felix's sin. He was telling him that, look, God requires righteousness and none of us are righteous. In the eyes of God, we are all sinners and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. It's no surprise if we've read the book of Romans. This this is Paul's main point throughout his preaching. That all have fallen short of the glory of God. But also that there's a coming judgment. That we all, because of our sin, will be judged by God and we all deserve death and eternal condemnation. We see this also in the book of Romans 6.23, and the wages of sin is death. So as Paul has this chance to speak to Felix and, and argue his case, he presents the gospel to him and he tells Felix, you need to be righteous. And none of us are righteous on our own. We are all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. And we all deserve judgment. And we all one day will be judged by God. Think about that. Felix, 
thinks of himself as the judge. But Paul is telling him, Felix, you one day too will be judged by the judge of all judges. What are you going to do? I'm sure that Paul shared the truth of Christ because it tells him that he uh, uh, spoke to him about faith in Christ Jesus back in verse 23 or verse 24. And he told him, look, yes, you have fallen short. No, you're not righteous on your own, but God has done something for you. He has sent his son into the world who's died on the cross, but he's been resurrected to new life. And if you place your faith in him, you'll be saved. So Felix, while you are, your righteousness doesn't measure up and you have fallen under the judgment of God, there is a way to be saved. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. What will you do? Look what it says about this here. Verse 25 again, it says, as he, And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed. Or some of the translations say he was fearful. So Felix heard the word and it impacted him. Here was the response by Felix here. He heard about his sin and his uh, coming judgment and he was alarmed. It caused him some fear. But what else does he do? What does he do after that? He was alarmed and said, go away for the present and when I get an opportunity, I will summon you. So as he heard the truth, and as he was uh, convicted of his coming judgment, he said, I need some time. Go away and I'll bring you back when I'm ready. Felix's response here is that he was basically he put off his decision about what he needed to do here. He decided he was going to wait. But while he puts off his decision, he actually turns deeper into his sin because as he puts off this decision until later, he also becomes uh, desirous of the gain that he can have through Paul and desires to be bribed. So as Felix was brought to the point of making a decision and he decides to put off his decision until later, it actually was the wrong decision on Felix's part because now he begins to go further and further into his sin as he begins to want money and gain for himself. This is a warning for us as well as we come into contact with the gospel that as, as the truth of the word bears on our hearts and as we're convicted of our sin and the need to make a decision that we too sometimes uh, can be tempted to say, I'm going to put this off until later. I'm going to push this aside and I'll come back to it later. The problem is, later might not ever come. You see, you can dive deeper into your sin just like Felix did. And that sin can pull you away to the point where you'll never come back to that point. The other thing is we just simply don't know how much longer we have. We never know when our last breath is. We don't know. So later just isn't the right thing to say. I'm going to wait until later to make this decision. Felix puts off this decision and he, and he obviously goes deeper into his sin as he hopes he would gain money from this. But also, look what he says later. So he sends for him often and converse with him. And when two years had elapsed, he spent two years having these conversations with Paul and he still never made a decision. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. This is when Nero became emperor and replaced Felix. Uh, in desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Rather than do what was right, he decided to do what was beneficial to himself. And he left Paul in prison. So this tells us where Felix's heart ended up. He was brought to an understanding. He had an accurate knowledge of the way. 
He was brought to an understanding about faith in Jesus Christ. He knew about his sin. He knew about the coming judgment. He decided he was going to put off any decision, and eventually he just never made the decision. Scripture tells us that when we are brought to that point, we need to make a decision now. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. When God in His grace comes to you, and opens your eyes to the truth of the Gospel. When your sin has come clear to you and your need for a Savior is clear to you, you must respond. To push it away is dangerous as we see in the life of Felix. So my question today is this. What have you done with your knowledge of the gospel? I hope that you have an, uh, an accurate understanding of Christianity, what it's all about. That we are all sinners, that we have all fallen short of the glory of God, and because of our sin, God's judgment is on us. But God in His grace and in His love for mankind has given His only Son, Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice for our sins. That Christ lived a sinless, perfect life, the life that we never could live on our own. And He went to a cross as a sacrifice for our sins. And that when we place our trust in Him and what He has done for us, not just knowing what He did, but tr actually placing our trust in what He did. Laying aside anything that we could do on our own. I don't come to God and say, look God, I've done so much good. Look how good I have been. Look how much money I have given to the church. Look at all these wonderful things I have done. I'm sure you're happy with me, right God? No. We come to God and we say, God, I know I am a sinner. I know I don't deserve Your grace. But thank you for what Jesus Christ did for me. Because He's the only one that could save me. And so when we come to that understanding and we trust in what Christ has done and we stop trusting in ourselves, we're told that we are saved. Our sins are forgiven because Christ has taken the punishment for us. And that we're made righteous, not because of we are righteous, because of what we have done, but because Christ is righteous and what He has done. And His righteousness is, given to, righteousness is given to us. We give Him our sin and He gives us His righteousness. And we have eternal life because of Him. So what have you done with all that knowledge of Christianity? You may know that all of that is true, but the question is, what have you done? Have you actually trusted in Christ? Just knowing the facts isn't enough. Have you truly trusted in Christ as your Savior? Calling out on Him, saying, Lord, I can't save myself. But I trust that You have saved me through what You have done. Have you done that this morning? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word that does teach us about all that you have done and all that your son has done for us. But Lord, we know that we can't just have all of the knowledge and that save us. We must do something with that knowledge. Lord, I pray that as we understand the truth of Your Word, that we will turn to Christ and we will trust in Him. Lord, that our lives will be lived in such a way that bring glory and honor to You. Lord, help us to know today if we truly are Yours. I pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, we will also go into the world and 
and tell others about these great things, sharing the good news with them that salvation is available to all who will turn to Christ. We thank you and we praise you in his name.